Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge. In this session, we welcome Dr. Brian Gearan for a presentation and discussion about the place of social capital in reading research. Brian Gearan is a research associate at the University of Oregon's Center for Teaching and Learning. He co-leads dissemination efforts at the National Center for Improving Literacy and is project manager for the Lead for Literacy Center. Two federally funded project aims at promoting the use of technically adequate assessment and evidence-based instruction in the United States. His research is broadly focused on promoting equitable literacy outcomes through evidence-based practices and policies. I invited Brian to give this webinar because of his excellent 2017 article published in the Journal of Education Policy titled, The Mis Mismeasure of Monkeys, Education, Policy Research and the Evolution of Social Capital. I've read it several times and I've cited it in, even cited it in my webinar um, a couple of weeks ago. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, Brian, and over to you. Great, thanks for the introduction, Tristan. I'm very happy to be here. So I want to start my presentation by emphasizing something to the audience from the outset. Unlike uh, many of the guests to the research group to date, I have not done much or really any research on social capital since 2017 when I published that article in the Journal of Education Policy on the history of social capital in education research. But since this is a study group with many members interested in doing research on social capital, I thought it might be helpful if I talk about why I haven't done any more research on social capital and what sorts of ideas I might explore if I were to engage with the concept again as a way of potentially giving audience members new ideas for research. Oops. Uh, to that end, um, I am going to uh, talk about how I got into researching uh, social capital in the first place. And uh, I will give a short summary of my 2017 article. From there, I'll pivot and talk about social capital's place in reading research, which is my primary area of study. And in so doing, I'll explain why I think social capital is a very interesting, but also a fairly impractical concept to work with in reading right now. And hopefully this can be a launching point for conversation during the Q&A session. So in terms of my background with social capital, I had a short but intense relationship with the concept as a doctoral student. I'm a former teacher turned researcher, and in the first year of my PhD program, I was invited by one of my instructors, Yong Zhao, to contribute a chapter to a book he was editing on constructs that are potentially important to education, but which typically go unassessed in mainstream contexts. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to write the chapter on social capital. Now, I did not have any background in studying social capital at the time, but the book proposal had already been hooked, uh, picked up by a publisher at this point. And social capital was one of the topics that it was meant to cover. So I was essentially given free reign to focus on whatever I wanted to in this chapter, so long as I was explaining how and why social capital might be measured in the classroom. So I accepted and immediately began to read everything I could on social capital. And fairly early on in the research process, I picked up Ben Fine's book, Theories of Social Capital, Researchers Behaving Badly, which as many of you probably know, is an extended critique of social capital research. Uh, Fine's book was a major influence on my thinking and frankly gave me pause about even completing the chapter, but through the process of conducting research for the chapter, I noticed some curious trends in the history of social capital that Fine didn't really dig into, and I wanted to learn more about them. These trends primarily concerned the beginning, and at the time, the end of social capital's history. Specifically, I was struck by the fact that some of the earliest mentions of social capital occurred in the field of education. Meanwhile, the premise of this book chapter was that social capital was not widely studied or applied in education. So that disconnection was sort of a surprise to me. The other surprise concerns social capital's later history. For reasons I, I still don't fully understand, when I was conducting research for the book chapter, Google Scholar kept recommending a couple of articles on social capital in non-human primates to me. 
And at first I just ignored these recommendations because it seemed too far removed from a classroom context to be practical reads. But after realizing that social capital had its origins in education, and after reading Fine's criticism of social capital, I became really curious about how the concept could have migrated so far from where it started. And that led me to write my education policy article, The Mismeasure of Monkeys. Now, I don't want to spend a ton of time reviewing the education policy article because it's a little dated at this point. And I also know the group has already heard talks from Tristan and Paul Haynes to cover a lot of the same ground in the article. But to briefly recap, my history traces the origins of the expression social capital from the field of education in the early 20th century to many other fields by the 2000s, including fields that study non-humans, and then surprisingly, back to education via some of these other fields. The history starts by considering some early uses of the term social capital by John Dewey and L.J. Hannafan, both in education in the early 20th century, but in very different roles. John Dewey was an extremely influential American philosopher of education, and he used the term in several places. One of those was in a public address against racism in education, where he said, all points of skill are represented in every race from the inferior individual to the superior individual and a society that does not furnish the environment and education and the opportunity of all kinds, which will bring out and make effective the superior ability where, wherever it is born, is not merely doing an injustice to that particular race and to those particular individuals, but it is doing an injustice to itself or it is depriving itself of just that much of social capital. The expression social capital was also used by L.J. Hannafan, a state education administrator in West Virginia, United States, who opened an essay on school community centers with the following sentence. In the use of the phrase social capital, I make no reference to the usual acceptation of the term capital, except in a figurative sense. I do not refer to real estate or to personal property or to cold cash, but rather to that in life which tends to make these tangible substances count for the most in the daily lives of the people, namely goodwill, fellowship, mutual sympathy, and social intercourse among a group of individuals and families who make up a social unit. The rural community, his logical center, is the school. Interestingly, both men use the term social capital mainly rhetorically to decry the state of education in the United States. For context, education in the United States was racially segregated when they uh, were writing, and it was and continues to be funded mainly on a local basis, which means that per pupil expenditures and expenditures on schools are driven by local income levels. So Dewey is saying that the United States was throwing away social capital by not providing equitable education to African-American students, whereas Hannafan invoked social capital to decry the state of education in the rural South more generally, before going on to describe how a project was undertaken that addressed this problem through community building. Neither man really has an explicit theory of social capital, Hannafan even says he's using the phrase figuratively, though interestingly, he concludes his essay with a statement that social capital is a prerequisite for actual capital, and that actual capital can be used to improve educational outcomes. After these initial mentions of social capital in the field of education, not much of academic interest happens for quite a while. Use of the term continues to grow, but it remains less common than socioeconomic status, a related term I'll talk more about in the second half of my talk. According to most of the metrics I've seen, scholarly activity on social capital really seems to pick up around the 1980s and 1990s. It was during this period of time that social capital starts being referenced in social scientific theories and these theories still predominantly concern education and the sociology of education. Two of the most noteworthy theoretical frameworks uh, where social capital is mentioned were those of Pierre Bourdieu and James Coleman, two sociologists with an interest in promoting or at least understanding equity and educational outcomes. 
So as I'm sure many of you know, Bourdieu was a French sociologist at the College of France, most active in the second half of the 20th century. Coleman was a sociologist at the University of Chicago who was most active at about the same time. Both researchers discuss social capital in response to the ongoing rise of human capital theory, an economic theory that frames education as an economic investment. But the two researchers had very different methodological and theoretical approaches to the work and very different conceptions of what social capital was. Uh, very briefly, Bourdieu developed a theory, or at least a critique of human capital theory, that questioned the relation between capital and education. In his view, students with access to more and different types of capital seem bound to do better in school relative to students with less capital. By extension, he argued, education effectively helps society reproduce social classes because even though, uh, even though education appears meritocratic, children tend to inherit their parents' social position despite or, or maybe even because of the education process. Social capital was just one form of capital that he discussed in his works. He also discussed economic, symbolic, and cultural capital. Uh, and for today's purposes, I'll just note that social capital was not a major focus of his writings, but he was one of the first, if not the first, to ground social capital within a theory. And in other words, not just using it rhetorically. Coleman was similarly interested in the effects of schools on educational outcomes, including questions about the effects of racial segregation. If Bourdieu was interested in how schools reproduce inequality, Coleman was more interested in how they could be made to promote equality, which is a subtle but important distinction. And importantly, by the time he was writing about social capital, he had already published his landmark Coleman Report, which was a federally funded study on the equality of educational opportunities in the United States. And it unexpectedly and somewhat controversially found that educational achievement gaps primarily reflect student background characteristics like socioeconomic status, rather than school characteristics like per pupil expenditures. Uh, a finding which had major implications for school desegregation efforts and education policy debates more generally. In contrast to Bourdieu, and perhaps as a result of his work on the Coleman Report, Coleman was a proponent of human capital theory. And in 1988, he wrote an essay arguing that uh, developing social capital was an important part of developing human capital. Coleman defines social capital in this essay as consisting of things like obligations and expectations, information channels, and social norms. But he also indicated that social capital was anything that facilitates individual or collective action and that it's defined by its function. After laying out these different theories of social capital, I described the rapid increase in use of the term around the year 2000, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone and research investigating social capital by the OECD and World Bank are often credited with really contributing to the surge in the expression's popularity. And I think that's probably right. But one of the things I tried to do in my history was describe some of the historical factors that may have indirectly supported this growth in popularity. In other words, why did social capital become popular when it did? Why was there an appetite for the concept in the early 2000s, but not as much in the 1980s? And I offer a few possibilities. Uh, so some of the major historical changes that occurred around this time include the collapse of the Soviet Union, growing levels of income inequality, especially in Anglophone countries, and the rise of public-private partnerships, as, again, especially in Anglophone uh, governments. Several scholars have argued that social capital became popular in response to the rise of neoliberalism, a term which itself took off in the 1980s and 90s. And though I've questioned the usefulness of the term neoliberalism, I think one can argue that many specific indicators of neoliberalism directly and indirectly contributed to demand for a concept that could uh, potentially unite the economic and social spheres in new ways. However, I part ways with some other scholars who have uh, called social capital a neoliberal concept because 
it was already not a singular concept at this point. Uh, and I don't think it would make sense to refer to Bourdieu's social capital as being neoliberal. There are also other potentially relevant historical changes that may have facilitated uh, its growth and popularity. Uh, higher education and academic publishing norms changed a lot around this time. We have more and more people going into higher education. There's more and more pressure on scholars to publish, especially as the share of tenure track faculty jobs in higher education begins to dwindle. Uh, and technology like Google Scholar, meanwhile, is just making it increasingly easy to consume research from other disciplines. So it may have simply become easier to do and publish research on social capital. And one of the strengths of social capital as, uh, as a concept is that it seems to offer the potential of uniting not just uh, different academic disciplines, but also different units of analysis, which uh, might even foster communication between subdisciplines. My history ends with a consideration of some of the unexpected places social capital ends up in academic research. As I mentioned earlier, I was most surprised to see it end up in the study of non and early humans because the development of the concept of capital is a fairly recent phenomenon in human history. And it didn't strike me as self-evident that social capital could be effectively applied to non or early human contexts. And what I found was that in the case of the non-human primate studies, Researchers seem to be using the expression sort of rhetorically again, like it was first used in the early 20th century. So in the cases of Silk and Brent, two studies of non-human primates, social capital is equated with social bonds and social support. And these are in turn operationalized through behaviors like non-aggressive interactions, vocalizations, uh, proximity to other group mates, and grooming. Uh, and there's really no attempt in these papers to justify the use of the term social capital in place of these more familiar terms. In evolutionary psychology, by contrast, I found a paper by Kanazawa and Savage that proposed a new theory and definition of social capital, where they argued that social capital was any resource that adheres in relationships between individuals that directly or indirectly helps them attain reproductive success in a given environment which struck me as being pretty similar to Coleman's definition, but with the outcome now open to reproductive success in general. And interestingly enough, I even found some examples of educational research on social capital, citing the work of Kanazawa and Savage without reference to Coleman, Putnam, or Bourdieu. So the concept, or at least the expression, had essentially come full circle by this point, passing from the sociology of education to evolutionary psychology and back to education without reference to the original education uh, sociology works. So again, I found an increasing amount of interdisciplinary dialogue around the concept of social capital, which is potentially good for cross-pollinating ideas. But as others have pointed out, this dialogue has not been an unadulterated good in practice. Various criticisms of social capital have been put forth over the past decade or so, and it was apparent that very often the spread of social capital to new disciplines occurred without any attempt to address these criticisms. Uh, Haynes's 2009 article contains a convenient summary of some uh, common criticisms of social capital, and I'll quickly rattle those off now. So as applied in research, social capital is frequently not a form of capital per se. It might be something more like prestige, social norms, or a social network, which are explicitly not capital in most mainstream conceptions of capital. Social capital is not necessarily social either because it is often discussed as an individually held or produced good. When applied to new disciplines, social capital is also often not a new concept. Uh, in some cases, like the non-human primate studies I mentioned, social capital was simply equated with another more common term like social bonds, and it may not be clear why the term social capital is being used at all. Many definitions of social capital are also tautological, which means uh, it's uh, redundant essentially and apt to be applied in ways that are unfalsifiable. Coleman's definition of social capital, for example, defines social capital by its function, which essentially means that you have to know the effect of something before you can classify it as social capital. 
And on top of that, any resource that contributes to the outcome of interest can be considered social capital. So there are no real boundaries to the concept either. Finally, scholars have questioned whether social capital can be measured objectively. For example, to the extent social capital means something like prestige or social norms, it's context dependent because prestige and social norms are context dependent. Now I should emphasize that individual studies may do a great job of addressing one or several of these criticisms. Uh, one of the pro problems I described in the article though is that across studies, it's difficult to synthesize findings because researchers tend to operationalize social capital in different and often incompatible ways. Concerns have also been raised that invoking social capital can serve to obscure weak theory. Essentially, researchers can tread on the by now vast amount of social, uh, social capital research that's been conducted without really digging into how and why the concept or if applicable its theoretical roots uh, should be fit into their own fields. And this problem is particularly evident in the large number of papers that mention social capital without ever defining it. Uh, and uh, as I argue in the article, this is a problem because social capital never had a singular meaning and from pretty early on was cited in uh, almost competing theoretical frameworks. Despite these criticisms, uh, I predicted at the end of my paper that I thought scholarship on social capital will continue to grow because it is a very catchy and intuitive term that has managed to proliferate despite these limitations so far. Uh, and that prediction seems to have been borne out. So that's my quick recap of my history of social capital. I found it to be a surprising and vigorous expression that seems to keep growing in use despite not really being a singular concept and despite an array of criticisms about its use in the social sciences. Uh, in the next portion of my talk, I'm gonna give a quick overview of social capital's place in reading research, a place where it has a fairly limited presence right now. And my goal in this section of the talk will be to illustrate why it might not have much of a presence and what might need to happen for it to have a greater and, and helpful presence in this area of research. Uh, before moving on though, I thought I'd stop and see if there were any questions about the first part of my talk. Um, ideally, we would leave, um, we would stick to more factual questions at this point because I'm gonna illustrate some of the criticisms I, I talked about in the second part of my talk, uh, but definitely points of clarification, uh, I'd be happy to address at this point. So if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to put, put them in the chat if you would like me to read them out for you, um, or you could raise your hand within Zoom. Um, you just go to the, the ribbon at the bottom, click on reactions and click on uh, raise hand if you have any questions you'd like to bring up at this point. Just give you 10 seconds or so if anybody um, would like to put forward a question at this point, otherwise we, we can move on. I can't find anybody in the group. Sorry, Brian. I can't find anybody that's here that's actually uh, asked a question previously, Tristan, so. No, I think at this point, Brian's just looking for any real points of clarification, I suppose, about the first part. First part. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't seem like there's any questions at this point, Brian. I think you've explained it eloquently, so we can move on. Sounds good. Okay, so as I've said, I'm a scientist that mainly studies reading development in children and factors that can promote reading development, like adult education. And to the best of my knowledge, social capital has only superficially reached the area of reading research. I did a short review of social capital in some high impact reading journals in preparation for this talk. And as you can see of the roughly 7,000 articles that have been published in these outlets, only about 42 contain the words social capital. Interestingly, most of these mentions occur in the year 2011 specifically, and most of those mentions that did not occur in 2011 occurred before 2011, suggesting that the, the subfield of reading may have already moved on from the concept. 
In terms of how social capital is used in these articles, I found that the expression generally does not appear in the titles of these articles. And it's almost never a measured variable. So if you've been around the block with social capital, and if you've read Fine's book or my article, you can probably guess what's going on. You have these articles coming out in 2010 and 2011 with a passing mention of social capital. Social capital is typically undefined. And if you're lucky, it is a reference to one of the big three researchers, Coleman, Bourdieu, or Putnam, but no real engagement with the concept itself or any of the criticism that began to surface around 2010, which incidentally is around the time that Haynes and Fine published their critiques of social capital. This is a figure that the social capital research group made for uh, one of the videos, so uh, social capital interest and growth over time that I think corroborates my observations about slow growth in reading research. So you can see at the top arrow that social capital as a topic is most common in management, sociology, and economics, which is no surprise given the expression's origin. Uh, educational research, which is the middle arrow, has recently become a top 10 user of the concept. But education is an inherently interdisciplinary space with a substantial portion of research coming out of sociology and econo uh, economics. So that's not terribly surprising. Reading research, like education research, is an inherently interdisciplinary field as well. But importantly, it probably skews more heavily toward research that's grounded in psychology. And at the moment, you can see that psychology is uh, down at the lowest arrow, and it's pretty far down the list, indicating the expression doesn't get used as much in that discipline. And I'm going to discuss why I think that's the case, though I can't speak for other researchers. Three methodological limitations uh, really leap out at me, and they've definitely made me reluctant to conduct research on social capital in the area of reading despite having a personal interest in the concept and a professional interest in studying equity issues in reading. So the first challenge is pretty straightforward. It's the unit of analysis problem. Social capital has its theoretical origins in sociology. Sociology is concerned with uh, human relationships, institutions, and patterns in culture. Psychology, by contrast, is generally concerned with understanding individual minds. And this different area of focus means applying social capital to psychology is not a straightforward task. From a psychological perspective, there is some challenging ambiguity about where social capital is located that's uh, going to directly impact any empirical models that I tried to present. Social capital is often said to inhere within relationships, for example. But psychologists tend to take individuals rather than relationships as their unit of analysis. Mainstream education research, for example, tends to be interested in students nested in classrooms, which are in turn nested in schools. Contemporary statistical methods can model variation in students, classrooms, and schools simultaneously, but you need to specify concretely the level that social capital belongs to. Uh, and many theories of social capital imply or state outright that social capital is located in between these levels, which raises questions in at least my mind about how I would model it. If we're talking about social capital among teachers, for example, is my unit of analysis teachers, the schools they're in, or something else? I'm not sure, but I would have to take a stance on the issue and you know, doing so uh, I'm sure would uh, at least attract the attention of one reviewer and it's gonna be back and forth uh, before any type of publication is gonna happen. The idea that social capital is defined by its function also presents some modeling challenges for similar reasons. Using path diagrams, we often describe students' scores on a test as being affected by classroom level variance and measurement error. And those causal effects are represented by arrows in this diagram. So over on the right, we have our student scores with uh, various presumably causal effects creating the observed variation in student 
uh, reading scores. But if social capital is any resource that contributes to an outcome, which is what Coleman argued, it almost sounds to me like social capital is the arrow and not a variable of interest per se. Now, this may seem like an esoteric problem to some of you, but for context, many grant makers in the United States, including the federal government, actively require grant seekers to make student outcomes the primary outcome of interest in any research proposal. So if social capital cannot be appropriately framed as a student outcome, it's going to be harder for me to get grant money to do research on it. It's not impossible, but you'd probably have to do something like make social capital a secondary or tertiary question. So you're focused on students, but maybe also um, you know, doing this sort of secondary analysis that looks at social relationships. The different units of analysis also make it difficult to map sociological theories onto extant psychological ones in a straightforward manner. Bourdieu's work, for example, touches on things like language development, dialect, schools, literacy, and parent education, all of which are relevant to the work I do, but since the intention of his work was to explain how social classes reproduce themselves, not to offer a theory of learning per se, it does not lend itself to mainstream reading research paradigms. On the screen, for example, is a heuristic called the Scarborough Reading Rope which conveys how different aspects of reading fit together to promote skilled reading development in children. So we can see that skilled reading is thought to be the product of two major strands on the left, language comprehension and word recognition. Language comprehension and word recognition can in turn be broken down into component skills like background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge, phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. Now, if you're familiar with Bourdieu, you're hopefully getting ideas about how some of these skills could be related to his theories of capital and fields, right? Students from marginalized backgrounds perhaps have less access to capital, like test relevant background uh, knowledge, uh, test assessed vocabulary, and so forth. And they consequently do less well on things like reading tests. Uh, my mind can very easily connect Bourdieu's research to work by uh, researchers like Julie Washington, who've discussed issues about test bias for speakers of African American English and other marginalized dialects. The problem is, it's sort of taken as a given in reading research that students from marginalized backgrounds have different developmental experiences that contribute to their different reading outcomes. That is, it's not that reading researchers and developmental psychologists discount Bourdieu's work out of hand. The issue is that psychological research on equity typically aims to move explanation in the opposite direction as the sociologist, maybe from the child up and not so much from society down. And while we can make connections between psychological and sociological theories, Social capital theories are not specified in enough detail to be very useful to psychologists right now, right? So a psychologist or a cognitive linguist uh, might dedicate their entire career to studying just one of these threads or even just part of one of these threads. And they're gonna wanna know in detail how social capital, however you define it, helps, and critically how it does not help these skills develop within a lifetime. But the most well-known theories of social capital in education aren't really meant to explain individual learning trajectories. So there's a need for uh, theory development. The second challenge is essentially an extension of the first. And it is that the best known theories of social capital in education are underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped with respect to contemporary research findings and policy trends. Coleman and Bourdieu's theories are some of the most frequently mentioned in education research, but they're, they're a bit dated at this point and are therefore mute when it comes to engaging with more recent research on reading development in marginalized populations with the many important changes that have occurred in the education policy landscape since the times that they wrote. 
broadly speaking, both of their conceptions of social capital miss a lot of messiness in terms of how social background seems to relate to student outcomes that we're starting to understand. For example, coming from a, a Bordeauxian framework, one might expect that the purpose of school is to maintain achievement gaps between groups as a way of legitimizing social class differences. But when one looks at uh, patterns in achievement gaps, the mechanisms through which schools might do this are, are not so clear. On the screen, you can see racial achievement gaps in the United States from 1992 to 2019. And you'll note that although white students continue to score higher on average than black students, the extent to which this is true has changed significantly over time and in different ways by grade level. The gap has shrunk in grades uh, K through eight. In grade 12, it seems to have increased, but there's emerging research suggesting that this apparent widening is actually the result of decreased rates of high school dropout. So the gap is potentially misleading. And I don't think it's self-evident what Bourdieu would say about this, given the way he worded his theories. But at least, superficial, uh, at least superficially, it would seem to run counter to the idea that schools reproduce inequality. Education systems, perhaps. But I think this sort of trend uh, needs to be addressed in applications of his theory, because it bears directly on questions of mechanisms uh, of class reproduction. Gaps between students by parent education level add further complications. Uh, to me, these seem more in line with Bourdieu's earlier work. In contrast to the black-white achievement gap we saw on the previous slide, the gap between students with more and less education, uh, excuse me, uh, with more and less educated parents uh, seems to have grown since the 1990s with the caveat that growth in grade 12 may reflect some of the aforementioned bias uh, from lower rates of dropout. And yet there's more messiness if you look at what is happening within cohorts of students instead of just looking at one grade level over time. This chart illustrates growth in reading of a nationally representative sample of American students who entered kindergarten in 2011, and it follows them as they progress through grade four. And it illustrates an increasingly common finding that racial minorities and students from low SES backgrounds often start and end their school careers with, uh, on average, lower reading levels than their more privileged peers. But they actually grow faster on average. That is the gaps in the spring of grade four is smaller than the gap in the fall of kindergarten. I don't think there's any agreement on why that's the case. It could be that earlier skills are simply acquired more quickly. It could be that schools have had some level of success in reducing inequality or something else entirely. But whatever's going on, it complicates a straightforward application of Bourdieu's theoretical treatment of social capital. Schools seem to reduce but not eliminate inequality in reading outcomes, both across and within cohorts of students. But it doesn't do this for all marginalized groups. Uh, and I've, given, I've just given a few quantitative examples for today's talk because they're relatively easy to understand. But reading and literacy researchers that work in qualitative and critical paradigms have made similar observations about difficulties in applying Bourdieu's framework when you want to understand specific subpopulations, specific students, or specific literacy outcomes, because it doesn't address things like the unique strengths of students from marginalized groups or challenges that might be particular to a marginalized group. The education policy context has also changed substantially since the 1980s. In the United States, for example, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was passed the year before the Coleman Report was published, and which was a catalyst in some sense for the report, has undergone two massive revisions at this point. The No Child Left Behind Act and Every Student Succeeds Act. And I won't belabor the differences between these three policies, but um, a lot of ink has been spilled on how these policies have variously shifted the focus of schooling to accountability, the performance of historically underserved groups and so forth. And I just think there's a, a need for comment on the feasibility of applying Coleman and Bourdieu's social capitals to current context, given how much has changed. 
to what extent do their original assumptions about education and educational inequality still hold? And I know this example is of uh, American policy, but to my understanding, uh, thanks to international policy borrowing, uh, England, Australia, and other countries have seen uh, similar shifts within their education systems. So further use of social capital uh, in reading would really benefit for, from uh, theory development uh, and or theory refinement. Lastly, the need for social capital as an explanatory concept in psychologically oriented research isn't obvious to me. As psychologists have become more interested in studying social inequality in recent decades, they've tended to gravitate towards a more familiar construct, socioeconomic status, which in research tends to be operationalized as parent education level, household income, parental occupational prestige, and in the Hollingshead model of SES, marital status. And I think the relative usefulness of SES hasn't left a lot of room for a concept like social capital to do explanatory work when our outcome of interest is reading ability. Quantitatively, it doesn't leave a lot of room because there just isn't a lot of variance left to explain if we model social capital after SES. Uh, across studies, each SES indicator has an average correlation with most reading outcomes of around 0.2 to 0.3. Social capital variables like general social network characteristics, uh, a parent's educational aspirations for their child, and uh, general parental involvement at the school probably aren't going to explain much unique variance beyond those measures. In fact, I know of at least one study that found social capital was not significantly related to differences in reading comprehension. But what if we took a different tack and made social capital reading specific? What if we take a Coleman-like approach and treat social capital as a mediating factor between uh, socioeconomic status and reading development instead of looking at whether it explains unique variants? Well, now we have a qualitative problem. Um, Invoking the term social capital in this case would essentially be moving us in the wrong direction of explanation because we're adding a layer of ambiguity that's just gonna create more needless work when it comes to translating research to practice. So to return to the reading rope, we might reasonably ask what sort of adult child interactions at home promote each of these component skills and then call them social capital post hoc. But it would be a lot more practical to make concrete recommendations like parents should try to read to their children 15 minutes a day or teach their children the alphabet and letter sound correspondences before they start kindergarten than it would be to tell parents or policymakers to try to increase family social capital, which is not that informative in and of itself. At the end of the day, I think we're really interested in uh, specific behavioral mediators of skill development because we want to help students read better whatever their family's socioeconomic background happens to be. So injecting the term social capital can inadvertently muddy the waters. So given these challenges, how might social capital be found in reading research? Well, I, I don't know if it can, but if it were to make a productive comeback, I, I think a few things would need to happen. Most importantly, in my opinion, is that a clear need for the concept needs to be established. And that would unfortunately probably entail some amount of conceptual redefinition. So there'd be yet another uh, definition of social capital in the mix. I don't think earlier theoretical treatments would be very productive given the limitations uh, within them that I just uh, gave an overview of. And I don't think we want to apply the expression social capital just for the sake of applying it because that's led to some of the problematic and superficial uses that we discussed earlier. Where are some potential areas of need? Well, I definitely think more work could be done elucidating how social networks broadly defined can promote or augment what are thought to be effective home literacy practices. In other words, shift some of the focus from student outcomes to explicit and implicit instructional practices at home or non-school settings. You can do the same thing for different types of organizations and non-school institutions like technical assistance centers, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, private companies, uh, many of which aim to promote effective home literacy practices, 
through things like advocacy, information sharing, and free and publicly accessible products? To what extent do their efforts actually make a difference? These questions could help describe the, the infrastructure of reading development, so to speak, while acknowledging the possibility that at the end of the day, parent-child and teacher-child interactions may be what really drive reading development for most children. In other words, the, the question allows that social capital actually might not be that important for reading development. And if it isn't, that's valuable knowledge because it would help societies locate more effective points of intervention. I should point out that neither of these two examples use the term social capital because in these particular instances, I don't think you'd want to obscure your independent variable. Different networks, different organizations are probably going to yield different answers to these questions. But these questions can still be thought of as being inspired by previous research on social capital. Alternatively, I think it's possible that a need for the concept may emerge organically if a theory were to be developed that better consolidates research on socioeconomic status and reading outcomes. As I suggested earlier, there's a lot of research on socioeconomic status and educational outcomes uh, and at many different levels of explanation. But socioeconomic status suffers from many of the same conceptual limitations as social capital and they go largely ignored in research as well. For instance, it's very common for researchers to just use one indicator of socioeconomic status in a model without explaining why it was selected or any resultant strengths or limitations. In other words, if a different indicator were used, you know, would, would our understanding of the results change? And how SES causes individual differences in reading outcomes is something that's not fully understood. Most theoretical treatments of socioeconomic status that I know of just sort of rehash the idea that students from higher SES backgrounds have access to more and better educational resources, which in turn promote greater educational achievement. And while I'm sure that's true, there's a need for a deeper understanding of what those resources are and how they work, because causal evidence about these mechanisms isn't great right now. Uh, behavioral geneticists, for example, often critique behavioral research on SES by pointing out that parents provide their children with both environments and genes, and that behavioral scientists may be making erroneous conclusions about how environments contribute to reading development by ignoring the role of shared genes. In my view, there's a need for social theory that better grapples with the messiness at lower levels of research that I've just been describing. Uh, Coleman's social capital was originally meant to help on this front. It was meant to help unite different levels of explanation. And maybe there's still a need for such a linking concept. Uh, but importantly, attempting to unite different levels of explanation can create some phony philosophical problems. Uh, because when you start bringing in facts from each level, it constrains the type of questions that you can ask. So if a new social capital were to be used for this purpose, I think it would be important to outline what assumptions about reality are being taken for granted and what sort of social capital questions would not make sense to ask. Uh, there are differences between why and how questions, for example. And I suspect that social capital uh, will be better suited to answering why questions because mechanistic how questions would probably be complicated by use of the term social capital. We don't we probably don't want shorthand in these types of how questions. Last, and in this case, maybe least, uh, future research on social capital should engage more with the criticisms that have been raised about social capital on theoretical and methodological grounds. But I actually don't think it's critical that all of the criticisms be addressed because no concept is perfect. And as I argued in my uh, 2017 article, social capital is not going away anytime soon. So it doesn't seem like a reasonable expectation that a researcher is going to address all of these uh, issues. Uh, as long as researchers are justifying use of the term and addressing the relative strengths and weaknesses of uh, any theories they might be employing, uh, I think they will naturally address many of the criticisms that have been raised. Uh, what you wouldn't want to do is just, you know, do a research paper on social capital where you don't define the term or explain why you're using it, I think. So I'm happy to start taking questions at this point. 
Uh, I can't promise I will have a lot of concrete answers given my background with social capital uh, research. Again, my, my journey with social capital was mainly a process of me trying to figure out what was going on. And once I had some understanding, deciding that social capital was a, a very interesting, but also very challenging concept to work with uh, if you're interested in reading outcomes. But I can certainly say more about my reasoning, which will hopefully be of benefit to some of uh, you who are interested in doing more research on social capital. Well, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, so some questions are popping up in the chat, which we'll get to. Uh, and also feel free to raise your hand within Zoom if you would like to, to ask a question yourself. Um, so I might start with the first question, Brian, and it, it is a very general one, of course, because the literature is so incredibly varied. But some people have suggested that the theoretical foundations, if, if there is such a thing for social capital, is implicitly based on rational choice theory coming through the work of Coleman, of course, who was very explicit about this and, and Putnam, who was perhaps less explicit or implicit about it. Uh, and it, it, that basically is the theoretical foundation that underpins the vast majority of, of the research. Now, my perspective is that it's perhaps that's not the case and that in fact, we see people adopting their own theoretical frameworks from whatever discipline or school of thought they're approaching social capital from. But, but what are your thoughts about, about this? Yeah, I agree. So I, I kind of get both perspectives. So on the one hand, uh, coming from Coleman, I, you know, using a rational actor theory makes sense. I mean, I, that's where Coleman's work was coming from, I think. Um, that said, you know, I, I don't think I would given that social capital is not one concept, I don't think it makes sense to say that's true for all applications of social capital. I also don't think that's necessarily true of uh, contemporary applications of Coleman's social capital. Um, I have seen papers where social capital really just means information sharing, and it really seems to be getting at infrastructure type questions, which, which I think are interesting, um, can probably, be framed in terms of uh, you know like a rational choice framework, but don't don't have to be. Um, I think one of the reasons I was interested in the concept of social capital, and I think if I were to continue working with it, would be more of that infrastructure set the the, the more general infrastructure sense, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure, and I think. Yeah, ben Fine has this theory about economics imperialism, that because the, at least the early theoretical foundations were, were rational choice, and Coleman was quite explicit about social capital being corrective to neoclassical economic theorizing or the, the narrowness or limitations of it. And therefore, uh, Ben Fine saw social capital as being a small deviation away from, from neoclassical theorizing. And therefore, right. economics imperialism, because it's basically importing that same kind of rational choice, uh, instrumental rationality thinking to the rest of the social sciences. Um, but of course, like if I reflect on my own experience as a geographer 20 years ago, wanting to employ social capital research, social capital as a concept in my research, I didn't have any imperialistic tendencies there. I, I didn't want to, I didn't really know about economic theorizing for a start, but I didn't want to modify that. I didn't want to apply that. I'd actually wanted to understand the social setting as it was. Now, 20 years ago, I didn't feel like I could generate the kinds of explanations I wanted to in my research context by using social capital. And so I didn't, I didn't, you, I didn't do that research and I instead worked on the theory um, I'm not sure where the question is, is going here, but I think I'm just really supporting your, your views that the vast majority of people using social capital research aren't looking at rational choice theory, and I don't think it is economics imperialism. Yeah, I, you know, I think, so again, I, I think fine identify something that's real. I think that is there in some of the research. I'm just saying there's more to that research because of the sort of strange history that the concept has had. I don't think it's a necessary condition for doing social capital research, given the way that the concept has evolved. Um, that said, if I can riff for a second here, one of the things that you know I kept thinking about as I was doing this research is um, sort of a lack of engagement with psychological research about you know the perceived benefits of working with other people. The, the non-human studies in particular, 
I was waiting to get some sort of explanation about why non-humans might see value in cooperating or living with their group mates that's going to sort of clarify things. Um, and given that social capital is frequently discussed in terms of norms or trust or these other sort of psychological constructs, I was expecting more engagement with psychological literature that I never found in the reviews that I've done. Um, so, you know, just a sort of stray thought, I do imagine that there is some low hanging fruit there. Um, it just seems, you know, like I said, in regard to the reading research, there's so much messiness that you, I think you could use to your advantage if you want to do uh, additional research on social capital. It's just you have to get in the weeds and, and deal with that messiness. Yeah, right. And I think like reflecting 20 years ago, I didn't feel like I had the research experience to be able to produce good quality research. You know, when I looked at the literature, I, I saw something that didn't provide a, a framework or a methodology for producing the kinds of explanations that I wanted to produce. And I probably didn't have the research experience to be able to, to do it myself, you know, to, to do that hard work of creating quality and rigorous research. I, I don't feel the same way now. And perhaps it kind of, with social capital, perhaps it kind of is left up to the researcher to do that hard work, to produce the rigorous quality research. Some people achieve it, and of course, and some people don't. And that's probably what we see in the literature. Exactly. Uh, so we move on to questions from, from other people. Um, Marion, who would have been first? Sorry, Marion, I think you're on mute. Was it Tim first? Uh, yes, I think Tim has a question or an observation that he'd like to have. Yep. Nope, I'm just making that comment. Please continue. <laughs> Well, I think we put that comment to, to Brian. Um, so the comment was that the the numbers, so this is on reading levels uh, on education achievement post COVID um, might be terrifying, I think was Tim's comment that perhaps COVID's had an impact on that. Yes, COVID has had an impact on reading levels. And as you would probably imagine, it's not been a straightforward impact. It has not impacted all students the same way. Um, I unfortunately don't have the, the numbers in front of me right now, but um, there, there are a lot of good papers that have simulated the impact of COVID and also done follow-up to sort of uh, show the impact of COVID. Um, it has been most uh, impactful on beginning reading skills, which is the area that um, I study um, and students from marginalized backgrounds have been affected the, the worst. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's true of reading, at least some educational outcomes, and it may be math, there have been instances uh, where, you know, higher SES groups uh, have actually benefited from studying at home and they've actually seen accelerated growth. So again, it's not been a straightforward impact, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something uh, that schools are continuing to grapple with, not just in terms of student outcomes, but just, um, just day-to-day -day management, it's, it's still uh, extremely stressful for a lot of school administrators right now. Excellent. Uh, Renuka had a question, or more yeah. a comment again, but you might like to, to comment on, on this, Brian, about the people who follow the natural learning approach, commonly called unschooling, um, and that contains in, interesting information on their reading development tra trajectory experience. Oh, unfortunately, I can't comment on that. I, that is beyond my scope of research. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Sure thing. Next one's from questions from Marion. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Brian, whether or not the segmentation, I'm sort of thinking in terms of Bordier, uh, segmenting between secondary and tertiary, we seem to sort of have this hard divide um, in the way that we look at education rather than looking at things, things like life world um habitus etc but uh, mostly the, the life world because the life continues across this major social space i i teach at university so have spent many years with first year university students so i'm wondering whether or not that does us any favors or whether or not um it it you know inhibits the totality of looking at the social capital 
Yeah, I thought about that a lot as well, because even though I study beginning reading development in elementary school students, I was formerly a secondary English teacher. And so when I read Bourdieu originally, a lot of his observations resonated with me, but it was surprising then when I looked at empirical data, it didn't necessarily match what you might expect given what he was observing. Um, the thing is, a lot of empirical research in the United States focuses on um, elementary education, I think, with the uh, expectation that if you can intervene earlier, it's going to be better for students in, in the long term. Um, I don't know that we have as uh, developed an understanding of what growth trajectory looks like at the secondary level. So as I said, um, I think it, research is really just emerging right now that the the growth in the gap might actually be due to decreased levels of high school dropout, for example. Um, you know, to what extent do achievement gaps continue to narrow in the secondary school? I don't, I'm not familiar with literature that really lays that out. It's, uh, I think it's possible that they start to widen again as students become uh, more self-aware, I guess, and start thinking about their futures, but I really don't know. And um, and again, I just think that's, uh, that's one example of why I think it would pay to, if, if you, if Bourdieu's framework speaks to you, develop it more because there's more, you know, it needs to be pulled mm. apart and I think reassembled a bit at this point. Yeah, because the, the students seem to, having spent 10 or 15 years with first year university students, they seem to categorize them in their minds very differently. Um, and uh, even the teachers sort of say to them, I'll oh, just get through this, you know, get into college or get into university, et cetera, uh, and then start thinking, you know, differently. Well, you know, that's not going to happen. But, right. I, I, you know, anyway, it's an interesting area. I'll leave the questions now. There's some other ones, interesting ones coming up. Thank you. So it does seem, and I think we hear this comment quite uh, regularly, that uh, Bourdieu's work provides this rich opportunity to explore further. Um, it's, it seems like more theoretical work needs to be done or could be done in this area. And I think that um, some scholars have commented that um, Bourdieu's exploration of social capital was relatively limited. You know, it was within the context, like you mentioned, of a wider framework, but he didn't actually even go as far as to uh, integrate it and comment on how it relates to his other sociological concepts like field and, and habitus. That was never really explored. And so it seems like there's a rich opportunity there. There's some work certainly being done, but it, it seems like more work could be done. And also to uh, update uh, a lot of these, these theories and thoughts, because it's been 40, 40 years, mm -hmm. really, since a lot of that work was done by Bourdieu. Yeah, exactly. And it really is a challenge to summarize his work because it's spread across works and he didn't make an attempt to synthesize it. I think most of the attempt, you know, all of the attempts I've seen to synthesize those works, are, these seem like valid readings to me. That's, you know, this is the way I understand it as well. But, you know, just subtle, I think he did this intentionally, but when he talks about um, education systems reproducing inequality, um, that can be taken a lot of different ways, right? Like, did, did he mean that schools literally like maintain achievement gaps or does he really just mean it's a legitimization of uh, social class by offering an opportunity to students to uh, you know, improve their education? I'm not sure what he'd say, but there, I do think there are very different implications to those two interpretations because the latter, it's not really schools or the education system per se. It's more like adults in society making inferences based on people's education. And that's, I think, an important difference because if you want to do something about that inequity, you're going to act in different ways. Right. And you also made the point in your paper, a 2017 paper, that Bourdieu probably or didn't intend for his, uh, his concepts to be used empirically. And so it doesn't really follow functionalist logic. And so therefore, anybody who wants to use those ideas empirically has the challenge of, of overcoming what would otherwise be a tautology. And, and so that's, that work, I think, is, is really yet to be done to, to understand how that can actually happen. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I have to say, despite people do essentially apply it functionally, though, <laughs> that's, you know, 
uh, despite it probably not being meant for that purpose. And so, uh, again, I, I do think a reboot on the theory would, uh, would, would be beneficial. Yeah, and even the way in which habitus as a theory has been um, critiqued for being for, for not involving agency as well. Like I think there's perhaps some work there to not to simply accept the theory of habitus as Bourdieu defined it, but actually to extend or improve it in some way, perhaps by invoking, and the way I think about this is like Habermas's concept of life world, for example, like a synthesis of those two concepts and ideas that are very similar might help to overcome some of those limitations of agency or other things that, have, that habit, uh, uh, habitus has been um, critiqued for as well. Right, yeah, exactly. So uh, Gina asks an interesting question and feel free to unmute yourself for any follow-ups, Gina. Uh, she asks, can you say more about what you uh, why you think social capital is not suitable for how questions? Yeah, so I'm riffing a bit here, but my, my reasoning is that once you start, the way social capital tends to be used is like as a catch-all for mechanisms rather than describing the mechanism. So in a social network analysis, social capital refers to resources that help that network. So like information exchange, knowledge and, and so forth. And as someone who's inter interested in intervention work, that's not so helpful to me because I need to know what information was exchanged and what knowledge was exchanged. Um, and so when we, want to understand mechanisms better is I think it's just going to be more efficient to just say what the mechanism is, right? So what knowledge, what information, instead of, if we call that social capital, um, you, you know, if you're coming from a Coleman framework, that is a, a valid thing to do. But when it comes to research translation, it just complicates things because, you know, whoever's translating that research then has to go back and see what that social capital actually was. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself, Gina, if you want to follow up. No, thank you. That that was um, that helped. I just wanted to hear a little bit more detail about that. Thank you. So, Brian, do you think it relates to the um, the the embedded assumptions that are involved in many of these uh, conceptual theoretical approaches to social capital that they they tend to involve um, assumptions of of causality? And so, and, and then when we do correlational research, it's difficult to generate the, the explanation for why. So that therefore the how questions, it's difficult to, to answer those kinds of questions, depending on, of course, the, the conceptual approach to social capital that's being used. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, you know, just to stick with Coleman and Bourdieu, they were developed for different purposes. And um, I, I feel like Bourdieu's framework is more, firmly fixed on explaining societal trends. And so it, it's more internally coherent. Whereas I think even Coleman himself tried to apply his interpretation of social capital to understanding like student, student outcomes, um, which, you know, depending on your read of the essay is kind of a, a fraud, maybe sort of a fraud endeavor. Um, you know, you can understand components of social capital, but again, why call it social capital? Why not just measure the thing that you're actually interested in? Right, and I wanted to get your thoughts also about the, the distinction between bonding and bridging social capital, because this is an area where I've seen some really good, fantastic research that probably is capable of producing explanations and perhaps answering some of those how questions. But I think more commonly with, with bonding and bridging distinction, we see the opposite of that. We, we see you know, where gross assumptions are being made that because people are like each other, then they have certain types of, of norms or trust levels, and then certain types of outcomes occur because of that. And it's all kind of feeds back to people simply being similar to each other in some sort of demographic or socioeconomic way. And so how you can develop explanations and answer those how questions using that kind of approach seems to be very difficult or really impossible. So I, was, I wanted yeah, to get your so thoughts about bonding bridging. Social, social network analysis is an area that I'm least familiar with. Um, I, I read Nanlin's work in, when I was writing this article, loved it. I thought it was so interesting, but um, I did not encounter a, a lot of empirical studies that were 
we're using it in, in my course of doing education research. Some has started to come out more recently. Um, I know of one paper that considered, uh, I guess you could call them reading outcomes broadly defined that use social network analysis and looked at things like structure of the social network to understand changes in teacher knowledge. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I don't really have anything interesting to say about um, you know, bridging per se. I, I will say what leapt out at me in, what I liked about the paper is that it explained how the structure of a social network may shape the flow of information, which they considered social capital in this particular paper I'm thinking of. Uh, that's potentially useful if you're interested in knowledge diffusion within organizations or trying to um, provide professional development for teachers. Um, the, what I kept wanting to know, though, I guess it was two things. I mean, one, why call it social capital? I, in this particular case, I don't know that it, it added a lot, but also the quality of that information, because as someone who, um, you know, I spend my time educating teachers, there are differences between different types of knowledge and information. I don't imagine that they diffuse exactly the same way. Um, so again, sort of paying attention to the, that qualitative piece, or again, maybe doing more theory development um, so we can have greater confidence about knowledge diffusing a certain way across networks um, would probably be helpful. And I'm sure I know people study use social network analysis to study things besides knowledge, um, but whatever resource is diffusing through these networks, I'm guessing that you could probably have a theory for each, each type of resource. And so, um, you know, not relying on Coleman, but instead developing some theory in that regard would probably be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question or comment more perhaps was from Mike. If the concept and theory remains muddy, should we disregard the claims of outcomes social capital produces? I'd well, like it, to defer it depends to... what you mean, right? So like, as, like I've said, I don't, there are lots of good articles on social capital when they're taken alone. It's, I'm not disputing their findings out of individual papers. The question you always need to be asking yourself is how do you synthesize this information? Um, because depending on how social capital is operationalized, you may have papers that are just doing totally different things. And um, I don't know that it makes sense to talk about uh, a general effect of social capital, right? I mean, just in the way, in terms of the way social capital has been operationalized, like social networks, trust norms, those are going to do different things, I assume. Um, and so, you know, I think it's going to be more productive to talk about what specific aspect of social capital you're really interested in. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Mike, did you have a follow up? No, I was going to defer to Renee because I thought she had much the same message, but worded it so much better than I did. So, right. But I think, Brian, like taking up on your point there, I think quite often the way that I approach social capital is that social capital provides the overall framework uh, for understanding a whole range of different outcomes and a whole range of different causal processes. And so quite often, I think it's useful to, to almost start with the outcome of interest and then work backwards to the kinds of causal relationships that produce that kind of outcome. And so making very generalized kind of comments about, well, social capital does X, I think isn't particularly useful. And as you've already explained in relation to like dissemination of information, different types of information may disseminate in very different kinds of ways. So the context there is absolutely critical. And then, and so making these generalized comments perhaps isn't isn't really useful or, or accurate. And we need to be getting more specific than that uh, into the real detail of what's going on. Yeah, exactly. So I'll read out Renee's comment. And again, Renee, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like uh, any follow-ups. Um, she says, thank you, Brian, for your presentation. Can you share more about augmenting educational outcomes, so the home literacy practices with social networks? Curious if within that context, do you have any thoughts to share about Lynn's definition of social capital as in the resources embedded within networks? Yeah, so um, 
I can answer the first part of the question better than the second, I think. So right now in the United States, there's been a, a lot of social and policy activity aimed at improving literacy practices, uh, especially by promoting uh, the translating knowledge of scientific research on reading uh, to schools and also to, to homes to some extent. And uh, one of the major actors in this process has been an advocacy group called Decoding Dyslexia. And uh, I've just been, I've been fascinated by the ways that both like the advocacy and uh, state level legislation seems to be shaping practice. And so to me, that, that's, a, that's a question right there. Like are people who are more connected to these advocacy groups more likely to know where to find good information about reading development and that sort of thing? Um, it seems to me like the answer must be yes, but I, I have no idea. Um, and I don't think um, there's been any empirical work on that. So I, I think that would be a sort of cool question to, to ask. Um, and same thing, you know, I work um, at a center aimed at raising knowledge about evidence-based uh, reading practices. Again, you know, to what extent is these types of organizations make a difference? I think it's a really interesting question. Um, in terms of Lynn's social capital, uh, like I said before, I'm not super familiar with social network analysis, so I couldn't give uh, a good, I can't really give good advice about methodologically how to do it. I was just describing. Um, there, are, there are probably people who are more qualified, I'm sure there are people who are more qualified to, to answer that. Um, I just I just found uh, Lynn's sort of justification for why he, uh, or excuse me, why uh, Lynn, um, described the network operating in certain ways really really compelling and, and interesting again because it's sort of just guess at things you know intuitively that people hadn't really come out and said before yeah and i think one of the things to realize of course is that uh nan lynn's approach to social capital is a really a rebranding of social resource theory which has been extensively developed over a long period of time and comes out of the the network um research approach which really has roots back to the 1950s and probably even earlier than that and so this is a considerable body of work that's been done that has a lot of internal rigor and and methodological uh, design built into it that i think is really quite different than say coleman's approach and a lot of the other uh research on social capital that's done because it has, has this coherence of course the as soon as that was bought in and which really happened i think from about 95 and was particularly culminated in, in nan lynn's book in 2001 and once that happened then you get of course this enormous amount of blurring and bleeding between these different ideas and approaches so you you, you find now researchers borrowing little bits from nan lynn and from ronald bird in yeah. that are basically a network approach and resource approach um, but then including uh, Putnam or, or Coleman or Bourdieu even into all of this, and it can get quite um, difficult <laughs> to say the least. But, but, yeah. but at the same time, maybe there's some, some improvements there because the network approach can be quite functionalist. And so, you know, including some of these other things perhaps can be useful. Yeah, and I'll say too, as you can probably guess from some of the slides I had in there, your, the, tra the training you have in model development definitely influences the, the way you think about asking research questions. And so, again, I don't do social network analysis, so I, I probably can't even come up with a, a great research question uh, that, that use it. Um, so uh, again, that may be another area to, to explore under the, the tutelage of someone more qualified than me. Um, Renata, this is super. No, I just wanted to say thank you. That's, uh, that was super helpful. I think um, I, I'm currently trying to shape that research question right now for, for my uh, dissertation. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with the muddiness where I'm looking at talking to other um, you know, folks that have used uh, social capital or social networks. And they're very explicit that I was only in the social capital space or I was only in the social network space. And to me, they're very much muddied a little bit together um but uh your uh your example of the of the access uh to those resources within the network um certainly resonates with me in the, in the application that i want to potentially uh put forth uh, my research so thank you yeah awesome <laughs>
Yeah, I think also it's probably worth noting that that, that entire body of, of sociological research has often been described as, as economic sociology. Like it, it is, is quite closely linked and perhaps based on the kinds of um, assumptions that are embedded in neoclassical economic theorizing. Like there's, there's, it's, it's kind of corrective to that perhaps, but it, it, it's loosely based on it. I think it's worth noting that as well. Um, have I missed any questions in the chat? Uh, that you know of, Marion. There was a couple of just comments of, of thank you and that they'll catch up with the recording later. And uh, Sabita also commented that the, the social network analysis was first used in analyzing student behavior in a classroom as well, which is just adding to that conversation about social network analysis. Yeah, yeah. Um... We have the one, one question that was submitted beforehand. I'm not sure that Brenda's actually here, but she asks, uh, school ratings are measured by their reading literacy scores. What are the best ways to promote a school-wide literacy program in consistently low-performing schools? How do we help school district leaders see literacy as a catalyst for developing social capital? Yeah, so um, with regard to the first part of the question, how do we uh, help uh, consistently low-performing schools? I think uh, expert opinion is converging on the use of something called a multi-tiered system of support in reading right now. Um, for those of you not in education, uh, multi-tiered systems of support are essentially a triage model where schools uh, screen students for reading difficulties um, early on in their school careers and also early on in the, in the academic year, and then attempt to provide them with uh, instructional interventions that are going to help them catch up uh, essentially. And depending on the level of need that they have, they may receive uh, additional intervention services. And so we, uh, we describe uh, the systems in terms of tier one, tier two, and tier three type services, with tier three being the, the most intensive. Um, I don't think multi-tiered systems of support are going to do anything like eliminate educational inequality, but the, the reason I think um, expert consensus is uh, you know, growing behind them is that um, it, there isn't really a serious contender in terms of a framework that is aimed at promoting students who uh, need assistance based on the observed difficulties that they seem to be having. Um, so that's what I say for the, the first part of the question. Um, the, the second part of the question uh, is harder to answer because it uh, gets at what I was saying in my talk. Um, I don't know, well, two things. So how do we get school leaders to appreciate that literacy can build social capital? You know, coming from the theoretical frameworks that I've been discussing, social capital uh, is usually framed as a prerequisite for human capital, right? So that is generally talked about as coming before uh, human capital uh, or, or literacy in, in this case. Uh, but I'm, I'm also not sure that school leaders don't value literacy or see the potential of uh, improving literacy as a way of improving social capital. I think it's more that they don't understand how difficult it is to coordinate a school-wide reading model because lots of education programs don't provide um, the, the training that they need to implement that uh, a school-wide model like a multi-tiered system of supported reading. So I think you know maybe if you want to do something practical is connect them with resources uh, like the National Center on Improving Literacy or the Lead for Literacy Center that offer free tools to start implementing a multi-tiered system of support. Um, and, and then hopefully that can help them start turning their school around. Excellent. Well, I have one final question unless anybody else comes up with another one as well. Um, very broadly, do you think it's possible for us to come up with a single definition of social capital that could be universally accepted? I, I don't, I tend to doubt it, I'll put it that way. But that's not just because of the history of social capital, which at this point has spawned many different definitions, but also because I think, you know, I, I think as uh, humanity has now committed to asking different types of questions with social capital and different types of questions are just going to require defi different definitions. I mean, I, I, you know, it takes different theories to understand different phenomena, especially at different levels of, of explanation. So I don't suspect that 
uh, there will ever be one definition to rule them all or anything like that. And I would tend to agree with that. So that, that makes me wonder whether or not we should be looking to differentiate and actually start using some slightly different terms to help to differentiate what we mean by social capital when we do mean different things by it. So potentially we could be saying things like social resource capital or social network capital, perhaps. Um, or maybe there's some other variations that we could use. I mean, we almost, I think, need to have a different term for board use. Uh, social capital. But again, other than saying board you in social capital, I'm not sure how we could get around that. But I think yeah. that sort of thing would be quite useful to do to start to differentiate the different meanings. Yeah, taxonomy of social capitals, maybe. Um, and, you know, board you social capital has the convenience, at least when I see a paper that's applying board you social capital, it's sort of like that's self-contained, at least, right? You know, I don't wonder what it meant there so much, but um, yeah, the, the other ones definitely can uh, present some issues to interpretation. Yeah, and I guess a similar question is, do you think it's actually possible to develop the theoretical foundations of social capital in a coherent kind of way? You know, in my webinar a couple of weeks ago, I made the point that being in this interdisciplinary space, it really is an opportunity to include various uh, explanations for human action and experience coming from, from rationality and economic kind of uh, ways of thinking about human action, as well as the sociological ones and the influence of social setting, as well as psychological ones and the cognitive processes, as well as instinct and morality. And so we have this opportunity to include all of these really as the theoretical foundation. But like, again, a very broad question, do you think it's possible to do that? I think it's possible to make coherent theories. I don't think there's going to be a singular coherent theory, again, just because uh, different disciplines have already uh, run away with the, the expression social capital. And um, even as you have more interdisciplinary work done, and even as that disciplinary work changes, um, you know, filters into the disciplines, these different disciplines aren't going to change the, the major focus of their, their research topics. Sociologists are going to be focused on society. The colleges are going to be focused on minds. That's not going to change. Um, so I think it's more, I think you can make coherent theories for different disciplines. Um, and I think the, the trick is when you're trying to work the sort of interdisciplinary space or different levels of explanation, that's when you need to be uh, really clear about what your framework is, can and can't do. And uh, if there's a way to conveniently uh, differentiate your framework from other frameworks that are out there, uh, that would also just be a, a boon to the field and future researchers. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems to be something that PhD students tend to do quite well, or a lot of them do, because they develop an explicit theoretical framework within their dissertation. But a lot of journal, perhaps, publications don't do quite so right. well because they're quick and ready, just get out there and, and publish the results and isn't necessarily explicit. And that, I think, is part of the reason that causes so much confusion, that, that they're not explicitly stating what it is, probably because there isn't space to do so in a journal publication, at least in part, and therefore people can misinterpret and mix and match and not understand the context of what they're doing. Yeah, that's interesting too. And, you know, that maybe that's another factor that has led to the sort of particular trajectory that social capital has taken because it did start in education. As I said, education is an inherently interdisciplinary space. So um, education, there's no hope that education journals would be able to, to do that, right? I mean, they're going to get uh, articles from uh, scholars with expertise in different areas. And so you're going to have this sort of natural bleeding together, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one final thing that I think tends to happen is people tend to make some pretty broad generalizations of the results of social capital research. And that seems to snowball to some extent. You know, yeah. somebody does some empirical research that finds perhaps a weak correlation between social capital and something else. And therefore, somebody else then quotes them stating, it's just a matter of fact, that, that this is an outcome of social capital. And then that just snowballs. And we end up with the sort of situation we're in now where social capital does absolutely everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, Ramat, did you want to comment? I haven't had a chance to read your chat just now. Feel free to unmute yourself. Sure, thanks, Tristan. Um, and apologies for not have, being able to join uh, earlier sessions. So the timing is just a, a slight problem. Um, but thanks, Brian, for the presentation. I actually had a quest 
it's it's let, let, let me um it is quite early where i'm at um i've noticed that there is a level of resistance to adopting alternative definitions of social capital that we found to be very useful in industry industry they, they it's um there's a less demand for rigor but um, greater demand for robustness and uh, one example is the Inaha Piat and Goshel's definition of social capital, and we found that to be very useful for a lot of industry applications, but not so much for research. There is a level of resistance. Why do you, I mean, do you see the same, um, should I say, a level of reluctance to adopt that? Or, I mean, do you think that it's still, you know, an open field, it's every, at anybody's game? Well, I don't know. So I guess it clarifying question. So you're seeing resistance within, you're saying you're seeing resistance within the, the field of work, but not in research. Is that right? Oh, the other way around, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I imagine is happening there is that you have gatekeepers that just don't want to introduce another definition of social capital needlessly because there are so many definitions that are out there already. Sure. So I, I do suspect that, um, you know, to get another definition to take traction, someone really is going to have to do like a pretty serious theoretical treatment that justifies the need for the concept because oh. it's, it's just going to create confusion. Otherwise, um, I don't, in, in education, people pretty much seem to stick to Bourdieu and Coleman's definitions of social capital from what I can see. And again, uh, it, I just think it's because their legacy to the field has been so massive. So, you know, it's just kind of, it's just easier to, to take that path. Point take it. Cheers. I think we perhaps see a similar sort of thing with um, bonding and bridging, where intuitively they're, they're fantastic concepts that can be really easily used in practical application. People intuitively understand what they mean, they understand the, the nuances of those, those kinds of ideas. But I, so commonly in research, we see difficulties in, in, in implying them empirically in rigorous ways that produces meaningful explanations. Agreed. And so that, that, just, that divide, that separation between the, the practical uh, utility of it, but the, the difficulties in research seems to be a real challenge because how do you produce the evidence base in research to support the practical application when it, there's just that mismatch that exists there? Yeah, it sounds like the technology is way ahead of science and I found that very peculiar but um but that's how the cookie crumbles apparently yeah and I, I find the same thing I think Ramat like I I will use the bonding and bridging type distinction in practice but I don't use it in research um and mm -hmm. that that presents a real challenge I think it is an interesting sort of thing because I do feel like if I were to use social capital colloquially I would like I would just mean influence and expect everyone to know what I meant even though I've never used it that way in my research right yeah and this presents real challenges because then you right. don't you, you can't produce the evidence base in research to support what you're actually meaning when you're using it informally or in, in practice yeah a real challenge well I think I think we can leave it there I think we've pretty well run out of time so we'll I'll wrap up and then we'll, we'll end the recording but if you can stay online just for a few more minutes after in case anyone has any informal uh, questions or comments that'd be great um, next week uh, our next presentation is by Dr Alexander Dill uh, who's running the World Social Capital Monitor which has been running since 2016 uh, and it's a simple interesting easy way to, to measure social capital all around the world just simply using a mobile and he's going to be talking about that and how it fits into sustainable development goals as well so that's uh, roughly the same time next week and you can register on the website uh, so thanks very much brian for, for your presentation and your time today we really appreciate it and it, i think i found it incredibly insightful and we certainly had a really active uh, discussion Thanks for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to end the.